A lot of people ask me about what technology is doing to our brains. And even more people ask me, should I allow my child to be on Skype, Facebook, texting, emailing, and listening to music whilst they're supposed to be studying for their exams? Well, I don't think you need a neuroscientist to tell you the answer to that. <laughs> so when I started playing with the idea of what will technology do to the future of the human brain and humanity, I first let it go to the deep emotional part of my brain. And the question I came up with that really bothered me was, will I be me? If technology continues to influence and shape our brains at the rate that it has in the last two decades, for the next four decades, then at the end of my life, will I be me? Will our children and grandchildren be the people that we thought they would be? Or will I be her? Some kind of human artificial intelligence hybrid. Okay, so I'm asking you to come on a journey with me along the stretch of my imagination, but I look at her and I think, I know she's going to be better than me. Faster, smarter, more efficient, less imperfect. But will she be kind? Will she be lovable, creative, intuitive, and philanthropic? The kinds of things I would like to be remembered for. So when it comes to technology and the future of the brain, I went all emotional first, and then my logical brain kicked in, and I needed to know. I wanted certainty, but I couldn't have it, could I? Because these questions, if we ponder them deeply enough, will I be me? What will technology do to the future of humanity? They push us into a space of ambiguity and disorientation. And there's actually a psychological phenomenon that describes that, and it's called liminality. It comes from the Latin word for threshold, and it's the middle stage of a process where you're no longer what you were before, but you don't yet know what you will be next. It's a time of fear and uncertainty, like a midlife crisis or an identity crisis. So liminality is a threshold between our previous way of structuring identity, time, or community, and a new way, which will be the future. Of course, at this point, we have choices. I have no doubt that technology holds many positives that will make a, a meaningful difference to our health and our wealth. But have we really thought about what it will do to humanity? Some people say we've already passed the tipping point where technology will be smarter than us. And a lot of people say that using technology has already affected their memory and concentration. And I think it's the things we haven't even thought of yet that are going to change us the most. So technology could be one of humanity's greatest innovations. But we've kind of been in this liminal space before. Industrial revolution, language, fire. Um, so let's look at language. I think it's one of the most critical innovations that human beings have made. So what does humanity even mean in words? Well, according to Wikipedia, so yes, I did use technology to find out. <laughs> um, it's the human species, so the total world population, the human condition, the totality of experience of existing as a human being, and as a virtue, it's a set of strengths focused on caring for others. And then there was another really weird one, it was called Humanity Plus, and it's an international non-governmental organization which advocates the use of emerging technologies to enhance our capabilities. So already, the boundary between humanity and technology has started to blur. So we can use emerging technologies to enhance our capabilities. Well, we know that we can take supplements and medications that can improve our memory and our concentration. They're called cognitive enhancers or nootropics. Some neuroscientists have been using transcranial stimulation, which is passing electromagnetic currents through your skull 
to change your mood or affect your pain. And we've already got fingerprint technology, retinal scan technology, and soon I'll have a chip in my palm that I can make payments with. But does this make us less human? Does it affect our personal relationships, our sense of belonging? When you think about things like the internet, smartphones, wearable technology, driverless cars, do you think about the negative consequences as well as the positive consequences? Because in terms of how intentionally we're letting technology into our lives, I was quite shocked when I heard Bill Gates just a couple of months ago say that if you have high school or lower education, you will be replaced by artificial intelligence in our lifetimes. Do you feel reassured that we can manage the fallout in society should this happen to our children? Or I should say, when it happens. So here's an image from the Human Connectome Project. It's the brain of a four-year-old boy taken by diffusion tensor imaging at Massachusetts General Hospital. It's beautiful, isn't it? But what will technology do to the brain of this four-year-old boy? Well, I don't think we really know because I don't think we've really thought about it. But some Native American tribes sit together in a circle and consider the consequences of their decisions on seven generations into the future. Can you imagine if we did that about technology? What, what do you think we would see? I mean, already, technology affects the different generations that exist in the world really differently. Some generations spend more time online than in than face to face in social situations. Some feel more connected, some feel more isolated. Some people see the internet as a place of deceit and superficiality, and other people say it's the only place they can truly be themselves. Well, technology has rocked our world, and it is not going away. I think it's up there with man discovering fire. And similarly, it is a chicken or egg situation. So we don't actually know whether we discovered how to make fire, and then we could eat protein, meat, we could cook meat and eat protein more efficiently, and then our prefrontal cortex, the part of the brain to do with articulated speech, so language, and predicting and planning for the future grew, or if we evolved that way, and then we learned to use tools and fire to make our lives easier and more efficient. So what will it be with technology? Will we let technology happen to us? Or can we use the power of neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to change itself, to harness technology for the benefit of humanity? Let me give you some examples of how the brain responds to both the internal and external environment and changes itself. So the first one that I think is really important, and I already talked about intentionality around technology, is that if you do something with positive intent, so for example, if you do exercise that you really enjoy, then you release more growth factors in your brain than if you make yourself go to the gym because you know it's good for you. So Carl Kotman, a professor at University of California, Irving, in his laboratories showed the difference between neural growth factor release in the brains of rodents that were either sedentary, did forced, involuntary, or voluntary exercise. So at the simplest level of explanation, three groups of rats, one group were kept in a confined space, one group were forced to run on a treadmill for a certain number of minutes or hours per day, and one group could roam around freely and get on a treadmill if they wanted to. The two groups that did exercise, whether they wanted to or not, got the benefits of oxygen in their brain, but only the group that did exercise when they wanted to also released a factor called BDNF, or brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which encouraged those nerve cells to grow and connect up together. So I think that already has implications, for example, for doing work that you really love. In controversial experiments on monkeys in the 1980s in the Silver Spring Laboratories, Edward Taub created some nerve damage to the nerves of the left arms of right-handed monkeys and then put their right arms in a sling for two weeks. 
so they had to use their left hand to feed themselves and clean themselves. By the end of two weeks, the map in the brain for the left hand and arm had grown and taken over the space of the map in the brain for the right hand and arm. It's pretty amazing, but you've probably experienced this yourself. If you speak English, Spanish, and Portuguese, so say if I lived in Brazil, spoke quite a lot of Portuguese, and then I moved to Argentina, and I stopped speaking Portuguese, and I started speaking more Spanish, then eventually, with disuse of one language, that part of my brain would shrink, and the part of the brain that was using more of another language would grow. So there's something that London cab drivers have that's very special, and that is that they learn the knowledge. So just like learning a language, it's a very attention-intense activity. By the time they have done the knowledge, they have a map of every street in London in their brain. And it takes years to do this. And brain scanning shows that at the end of that period of learning, the part of the brain that is to do with navigation and memory, the hippocampus, has grown. And there's a picture of it here. The hippocampus is part of the limbic system, which is that emotional, intuitive, deep, ancient part of our brain. We've known for a long time that a hormone called oxytocin encourages emotional bonding between mothers and newborn babies by adjusting activity in the limbic system. In just the last few years, we've seen that new fathers' brains are also rewired by oxytocin. And this seems to be evolution's way of giving men a biological imperative to stay in a unit family and ensure the safe upbringing of his children. In the Nordic countries, they're moving to having more equal maternity and paternity leave. So children are being brought up by parents of both genders more commonly. They've also had a longer standing movement around gender neutral clothing and gender neutral toys for, for children. This year in the Swedish dictionary, they even introduced a word that doesn't mean him or her, it just means that person. So putting that much intention into changing society in a certain direction is kind of what I think we should be doing with technology. To harness the uncertainty of this liminal space by taking what we know about how amazing our brains are and they change in response to what goes on around us and the intention that we have. I think we need to look inside, deep inside to those ancient parts of the brain that store every memory, every smell, every relationship, every emotion that we've ever had, and draw on our amazing intuition, creativity, and empathy to think about how we can harness technology to learn more about the universal or collective consciousness of humanity. Because that level of connectedness and compassion could be truly amazing for humanity. So I think we need to take that leap of faith, like we've done a few times before in evolution, and believe that maybe technology really could make us better human beings. Of together. <laughs>